this is exactly 5 p.m. I think that usually when I go to talks, I'm late. I don't know if other people will be too, but I, I'll, um, I'll just blather for a couple of minutes, so this would be a great time to tune out. Um, and then um, I'll, it'll get more interesting um, right as the last people come in the door probably. So uh, my name is Ben Sigelman. Uh, the last time I was in this building, or at least in this campus, my daughter is being born, so it's really weird to be here in <laughs> this context. Um, but uh, anyway, it's good to be here. I uh, work a lot on tracing. That's um, uh, both through my actual job as the founder of this company, Lightstep, which I'm not here to talk about, and um, through this open source thing that I spend most of my actual coding time on um, called Open Tracing. And I'm here really to talk about Open Tracing, uh, partly um, because I, I think um, it's really fun, uh, and partly because I think it's pretty important and useful, and I think the um, Anyone who's trying to build services at scale probably needs to be thinking about this general topic, and I, I think open tracing is an important piece of it. So hopefully if you're here, you already care about um, performance and, um, and distributed systems. Um, uh, if you don't, it'll still be interesting, but if you do, I think it will be relevant as well. So uh, with, without any further ado, I'll, I'll get started. Um, yeah, so I already introduced myself. Uh, I'm, uh, hopefully going to be interrupted by people who are asking questions or telling me I'm wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, please don't be shy about doing that. Um, I wanted to start by talking, I think everything that you present should like, be explained, like why does this matter? Why should anyone care? Uh, I guess the short version is that if you're trying to understand um, the behavior of a distributed system, I don't think it's really possible to do that efficiently without some kind of tracing solution. Certainly, um, my experience as a developer in the past has illustrated that it saves you like a lot of time when you need it. Um, um, but even stepping back beyond that, like, well, why does performance matter? And I think this is something where there's a lot of confusion. I think a lot of people think of performance for end user facing things as being about end user's efficiency. And at some level that's true, but it's not that um, if a page load takes five seconds versus one second, it's not that they're four seconds less efficient or something. It actually comes back to like woolly mammoths and like cave people in that um, if you are uh, a human being, which I think everyone in this room is, um, your brain was uh, evolved in this sort of scenario. And the tasks that we were accomplishing as people um, really were based on um, working memory, which is something that lasts at, at neuroscience level. Your working memory is a couple of seconds or so. There's some great tests online if you want to feel like really uh, incapable, <laughs> As, like um, go and do these working memory tests where they, you basically have to, they show you like colors or shapes or both and every two seconds or so they change and you have to remember the one from two times ago and they just keep on going and it's extremely difficult because your working memory is really only a second or two long and so if you have to remember something that happened five seconds ago and there's just a stream so your buffer is full, it's impossible. It's incredibly difficult to do. And this is really what latency is about. If you have a user who's on your product and they have to wait longer than their working memory, you force them to like move into longer term storage what their actual context was. It's like incredibly taxing um, for someone's just neuro, neuro function. And that's really what latency is about. So I just want to like say that's really what this is all about. Like it's about making sure that people who are like using technology aren't incredibly frustrated because we were designed to use spears which have like really low latency. Um, like you move your hand and it moves with you and not designed to like use products where you click a button and you wait five seconds until the next screen shows up. So that's really what this is all about. Okay, good. This is the last interesting slide um, that has a cool graphic, sorry, but the rest of it's going to be technical. But, but I do think it's important to come back to mammoths once in a while because like, that's really where we were about when we were evolving. Um, all right, so now into the present. <laughs> microservices, um, which they, they, they were not talking about here. Um, microservices, um, I think they're here to stay. I'm not here to pitch anyone on this. If you don't think that they're a good idea, Oh well, but I, I think that they have a lot of value, especially for larger end organizations, and I'm convinced that, that we'll be living with them for a long time to come um, by some name or another. I don't really care what we call them. Um, uh, the trouble with microservices is that your monitoring tools were designed to tell stories about single processes. That's what they were designed to do. And when you have a microservice, that doesn't really work that well. So if this was your monolithic app, um, 
and it was split into libraries or packages or something like that. And when a request would come into it, um, it would propagate through your monolith monolithic app and go out the other side or whatever. And um, and uh, when you have a microservice, those roughly speaking, I mean, obviously this is not perfectly precise, but like those packages can become individual services. So you'll see a lot of companies that have more services than they have developers. I'm, I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, but it is true. And when you're in that situation, um, it's, it's just really difficult. If this was the path that your, app, that your request used to take, uh, this is the path that your request takes now. And if your monitoring tools are designed to look at a single box at a time, it's extremely difficult to understand what's happening. I would argue that this is like the most important thing to recover from a visibility standpoint if you're trying to understand macro behavior in distributed systems. And I was at Google for too long. Don't stay there as long as I did. Big mistake. But I was there for nine years and like, uh, and I spent most of that time working on monitoring stuff, and, and this was basically the problem we were wrestling with the whole time, because they, you know, they had no choice because of various, you know, being on commodity hardware, they had no choice but to distribute things, and so we spent a lot of time trying to basically you know, uncover the story of distributed transactions, and that's, that's what Dapper was, which is a project I worked on for many years at Google, and, um, and I think the, um, you know, the rest of the industry um, is feeling a lot of the same pain that Google was feeling um, several years ago, um, um, and, and thus, there's been a lot of attention paid to these sorts of things. Um, um, and so, yeah, so you, distributed tracing, great. So this is the way that I think people should be doing um, uh, uh, storytelling about distributed systems. And again, I think monitoring is really about storytelling. You want the monitoring system to literally tell you a story about what happened in your system. And tracing is the most literal way of doing that. Um, uh, so yeah, this is when I show a demo. Um, of like an actual trace. Let's see. Um, so this um, this is a monitoring product. It happens to be my company's. So it's not the point. I promise this is not a sales pitch. So um, this is just some monitoring we have for something in our own system. Pretty standard time series monitoring. Um, in that we have the you know. 50th percentile, 80th, 95th, 99th. If nothing else, um, uh, this is a great illustration of why you should never measure average latency. It's like totally boring. It's this like blue line at the bottom. Um, but the uh, P99 is not so boring and not so happy either. Um, so this is pretty standard kind of latency monitoring. What's cool about tracing is that if you have a tracing system, you could you know select a range here, and on the bottom of the screen, you're seeing a list of links that are populating, showing you um, traces at these different latencies. So I can select this range or this range or whatever, where there was some kind of anomalous behavior. I'll open a few of these in um, separate tabs. Um, and then I can drill down and understand what the critical path was for that operation. So in point of fact, this is um, our inter I, I don't feel comfortable showing you customer data. So this is our own meta monitoring of um, an alert evaluation loop. And this is um, uh, a pretty simple trace, but I, I thought it would just be illustrative to show you something practical. So this is. Um, a polling loop for an alerting system. This is uh, one of these 95th percentile traces. It took a little over a second. Um, I can expand that to see kind of a critical path of what took place. Um, you can see it spent about 200 milliseconds getting a set of policies. It then makes a query that evaluates incredibly quickly. Um, I can like look at a bunch of payload data. So tracing is really just logging, um, but with a lot more dependency and critical path information. Um, and then you know it goes on to create alerts and deliver them via Slack, which is actually where most of the latency was. Was Slack took a second to respond to this request. So. This is just, um, again, it's a simple story. It's like if I, as a developer, wanted to use, I actually honestly would have assumed that our system was the problem. It turns out that the reason this was slow was because Slack took a second. Our evaluation took 2.6 milliseconds, so that wasn't the problem. So simple, like, in a way, but if you, um, if you don't have it all tied together in terms of causal relationships, this is actually very difficult. Um, to give you another example, um, we have this, like, little, uh, overlay thing that shows a trace of the current page view. So I just opened this page view. I can click on this thing. It's going to bring up a bunch of um, traces that it's collected from my browser. I'll select the one that is for this operation. And then I can look at a trace from my browser um, showing you know, performance timing information from the browser, uh, but also showing the XHR um, from the browser to the back end. And I can drill down until I eventually find a Google Cloud Store load with like the specific path. So if I was dissatisfied with the performance of the page view I just had, I can then examine, OK, like what exactly happened here? How much was in the browser? How much was on the server? And so on and so forth. So this is all like pretty straightforward um, 
stuff. Like this is not actually a very complicated system. There's a browser, there's a backend. Well, okay, there's two two backends talking to each other in this request, and there's Google Cloud Storage. It's not that not that complicated, but I would argue that if you were trying to debug this with just like query logs or something, you wouldn't have nearly this level of precision, and the critical path wouldn't be nearly as evident. And going back to anecdotes from my time at Google, I, I saw teams spend um, a couple person years, so they had many developers working for many quarters on performance improvements on their particular project. And they would get, let's, I'm just making this up, but it was like order of 20 or 30% improvement in their long tail latency, which is great. But it turns out their project was not on the critical path. It made no difference. Like, no user ever saw the benefit of that change. So if you're optimizing latency off the critical path, no one will ever see these changes. Like, and it, it's not even a throughput optimization, so you're not even saving resources. You're just making something faster that doesn't matter. So I, I would argue that if you're looking at distributed systems, optimizing the critical path is essential. And if you want to figure out what that is, you have no choice but to use a system like this. I mean, um, you have to use some kind of tracing system, and, and, and there are many of them. So this is not, again, a pitch for my company. Zipkin is a great open source project. I would recommend using that if you want. Um, OK, um, so why tracing has been broken. So I, I think like these demos are cool, like whatever, tracing is awesome. But there's this obvious question, sort of elephant in the room, like mammoth in the room, um, like why? Uh, isn't everyone doing this already if it's so useful? And the answer is that um, uh, instrumentation sucks Like for tracing. It's like a really nasty, nasty problem. And that's really what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I think that it's a solvable problem, but it requires like a little bit of coordination and standardization, which just hadn't happened yet um, until recently. So, um, so let me talk about distributed tracing instrumentation. I think there are four key properties for the instrumentation to actually work. Um, one, it has to be decoupled from any vendor. So in as much as I would love as the, you know, someone who's running my company to see my company be like tightly coupled to every uh, open source project and potential customer in the world, it's actually really bad for the customers and it's really bad for open source projects. Like no open source project in their right mind would tightly couple their project to some you know, for-profit vendor or even an open source vendor because one tracing system is appropriate for a small system, another is appropriate for a large system, and you don't want the instrumentation to have to be duplicated for each vendor. So it's critical that it's decoupled. Um, it's also really important that it's consistent because distributed systems use many languages. So yeah, Python is great. We're here talking about Python, but, um, but a lot of systems in production, certainly if they have web or mobile involved, have you know, at least three languages right off the bat. And then you um, add like you know, Go or Node or Java or whatever. And pretty soon, you have a bunch of different languages and potentially a bunch of different platforms. And if the nouns and verbs you're using aren't consistent across these platforms, it's very difficult to get a consistent story from the kind of macro tracing perspective. And, and unfortunately, you need that for it to work. So there's kind of a consistency issue. Um, I think monkey patching is a non-option in some languages. But in Python, of course, it's very much an option. And I do think it's a great way to prototype things. And I, I've done it for sure. But um, in general, I think it's a really bad story for monitoring. I have a friend who started a company in monitoring. And it was actually in PHP, not Python. But the story would. Um, would be the same either way. And so they made sort of monkey patch versions of a bunch of, um, well, <laughs> so initially, actually, what they were going to do is they were going to, uh, to offer a monitoring product for JavaScript, Python, and PHP, thinking that would like, get a good set of coverage. It turned out that that was like, too much to bite off. So they just did PHP, and they were going to monkey patch everything. So it was like a one-line integration. And then like, oh, that's actually a little bit too hard. So we'll just do PHP with this MySQL, with MySQL driver. Then it was like, no, actually, we need to do this MySQL driver version because it's just too hard to keep the stuff consistent. So although I think in a point in time you can monkey patch correctly, it's not feasible to have that be like maintain code. So you're never going to have good tests for it from the people who are changing these libraries. If, if the instrumentation isn't part of the software itself, um, like a test to be part of the software itself, I don't think it's going to like stand the test of time. So it does need to be explicit, which I think really limits the design space. Um, and then finally, uh, it's really, really important for tracing to make it easy to cross process boundaries. That's the whole point. And without that, it just doesn't work. So this is an area where, um, uh, where I think there's actually a lot of challenges from a software engineering standpoint. And open tracing has kind of an interesting story. Um, are there any questions like at, so far? Deafening silence. 
Okay. So this is not a slide that we're going to actually talk through in any detail, but um, I think what I wanted to say is that there's been a lot of effort actually in the past couple of years from people who are like neck deep in this stuff um, to standardize wire formats uh, for tracing systems. I think it's totally pointless. Like. Um, if you actually look at what the problems are, like the goals of instrumentation, which I outlined on this slide, none of them actually require that standardization. That's something that like the people who implement tracing systems would like, but it doesn't matter for users or instrumenters at all. Um, and uh, and the thing that we realized when we started working in open tracing, this is a bunch of us working on this from different companies, um, was that you really only need to standardize um, the thing that faces the application developer or the thing that faces the, the open source developer, just the instrumentation piece itself. The rest of it can really be totally decoupled, which is kind of beautiful. So there's no need to care about encoding formats. There's no need to care about um, uh, like the, even like the raw data model for stuff that gets out of the process. That also doesn't need to be part of open tracing. So open tracing is a very narrow specification. And I'll, I'll talk more about it um, in, in the forthcoming slides. Um, so this is like a really brief diagram showing, or, or a concise diagram showing the point of open tracing, kind of how it fits in. Basically, there's this API you program against. In every language that we have an API, it's like order of, uh, without comments, it's like 50 lines of code. It's a very small API. Um, and then there are a number of implementations in every language um, that, um, you know, obviously, um, take that data um, for the tracing data and will send it out of band to their system. So for instance, Zipkin is a popular tracing system. There are Zipkin implementations that will take this instrumentation data and send the, send the stuff off to Zipkin. That's great. And that's all pretty standard. You can think of it like StatsD or something like that. It's not like, that's not that novel or interesting. The thing that is interesting is that because um, tracing requires um, in-band propagation, by that I mean if, if the client makes an RPC to the server or just sends an HTTP request to the server for that matter, the tracing system needs to have some say in what goes over the wire. And to do that in a way that is um, decoupled from the implementations requires like a little bit of inversion of control and there's some tricks. And this is an area where open tracing has kind of an interesting strategy, I think, and I, I think a pretty effective one. And this has been part of the reason it's been somewhat successful is that, um, you know, there are now five different tracing systems that use open tracing. They can all kind of say what go, what little tiny tidbits they need to go into metadata headers and so on um, in a way that doesn't interfere with the application code. So the application developer, open source library maintainer doesn't need to care at all about the details of that format. Um, okay, so so far I haven't said anything about Python really. Uh, I just wanted to give an overview of open tracing first. Um, the rest of this talk will be a little bit more hands-on um, and I'll show how this actually works in practice. Um, uh, so Python versus other languages, it's kind of an interesting one. Um, um, I've been doing this in I think uh, I, about six languages and it's been interesting to see how, much, how different the the task of instrumenting actually is in these different languages. I would have thought going in that they'd be more similar than different, but um, one thing that really stands out is that thread locals are viable. Now, thread locals are available in many languages, but they're not viable for this sort of work in most systems. Um, in like uh, Java, for instance, there's, uh, and Node especially, there's so much asynchrony that uh, thread locals don't really mean very much. Like you don't stay in the same thread very much. In Python, it's more common to do that. And certainly, you know, Flask has really, you know, uh, bet pretty hard on that. There's a lot of context information that's passed through thread locals in, in Flask. And, and so you can rely on that in Python, which makes the task of doing this a lot easier, actually. Instrumentation in Python is generally a lot easier as a result. Um, uh, a minus in Python is that it's an old enough language that, in a rich enough community that there's many ways to do the same thing. It's not like, the, like there's this one thing that everyone uses for X or Y. There's usually two or five or 10 things. Um, and so it's harder to, to cover like the whole community with a few focus integrations. Compare that against Go, which is a much lang uh, younger language where there really aren't that many ways to do a couple of things so you can make a few small changes and get great coverage. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of people, when they come into Python and do this sort of stuff, they monkey patch things. I, I think that's a, a sin. Um, I think you should be strong and, and you should, you know, I, I'm, I'll take confession or whatever if, if you want to talk about it, but, um, but I, <laughs> I would encourage against it. Um, uh, and then performance is really funny in Python. Unlike Rails, which I think is a total abomination from a performance standpoint, just like by design, like Python actually can be kind of fast. I mean, it can't be like that fast because like you're, you know, you have the interpreter lock and so on and so forth. So it's not going to compete with C++ or something in like a, a really tight loop, but, um, or in, a, in like a, a proper, uh, 
macro benchmark, but um, but it's good enough to be taken seriously. So people care about performance in Python, and they're indeed like pretty performant projects out there that use Python and bet on it really hard. Um, but uh, performance is also bad enough that it's like, it's a problem. So uh, I think that's kind of a sweet spot for this stuff where um, there's a lot of performance sensitive stuff written in Python, but it doesn't always perform as well as you'd like. So um, there's more of a need, there's like more pain in the Python universe than in others, uh, which is one of the reasons why I think we've seen a lot of people interested in this project. So um, I, I now wanted to move on to like actually showing some code. Um, this is gonna be a lot more practical than the previous set of slides. Um, um, I wanted to talk about like how to create just um, a single span, how to create a parent-child relationship first. Um, go ahead, please. Um, that's a good question. So I was supposed to repeat questions. So um, the the question was, yeah, you know. Um, Python performance can often be uh, improved with the use of optimizing compilers, um, and uh, does that meddle with thread locals? Um, yeah, I do think it. I do think it. It does in some situations, and in others, it it does so less. I mean, I, I like. I I don't really know if there's like a, a fast and transfer. To me, it's more like a matter of conventions. There are situations where you can get away with it, and you have to kind of know that. I don't. It's not like. Um, Okay, I just like hated on Rails a minute ago. It's not like Rails where you absolutely know that there's only one request happening ever at the same time, which is embarrassing from a, a concurrency standpoint, but does make it awfully easy, right? It's like, okay, well, there's only one request, so it's just a global, right? It's incredibly easy. So it's not as easy as that, but I'm just saying that there are situations and scenarios where you know, you have control over the code path between point A and point B, and you know that you have a thread local that you can use. So it does require some knowledge of the system, and I don't think it's like a rule or something, but, um, uh, but it works. I don't know if anyone here uses Go, but like Go has addressed this problem by just, <laughs> I actually is one of the, only two times in my career at Google that I ever literally screamed at someone. One was um, because someone was trying to defraud customers, and I thought that was wrong, and so I yelled at him. And then the other time was when I was arguing with the Go team about this very issue, and they refused to add any kind of thread locals to their language, and they said, oh, it's okay, everyone's just gonna add a new parameter to every function call that could ever make a network request even down below the stack. So Go has this context object, and it's just a convention, you pass it, everywhere that could ever make a network request, which to me is a thread local. It's like, it's this implicit parameter in every function call. So I'm like, you've just made everyone change every function signature in their entire code base um, because you won't add thread locals. This is really silly. And I, was, I wouldn't have gotten angry about that, but then they were so glib about it, they didn't act like there's any sort of trade-off we made here. And they were just like, no, this is fine. And, I don't know, anyway. But with Python, at least you have the option, right? You can pass it explicitly when you need to, like in the situations you're talking about, or you can pass it implicitly when you know that you can get away with that. And I, I like that you have that flexibility. No. Anyway, whatever. Um, so uh, back to some like very simple examples. Um, are these visible? The code, you can like read it? Um, Okay, uh, so um, this is like a hello world example. So first of all, just talking about open tracing, um, there's, um, uh, this notion of a tracer, it doesn't have to be a global variable, it can be if you want to do that, um, but open tracing assumes that you initialize the tracer once per process. So in your main, you initialize it with some sort of backend. In this case, I'm using Lightstep, it's my company, but it could be Zipkin or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and then after that, you never need to refer to the implementation ever again. You just use open tracing from that point forward. So with the exception of these initialization lines, nothing here is proprietary to any vendor. It's all completely tr portable code from open tracing implementation to implementation. So, um, so the, I, the basic idea in, in, um, in the a data model in open tracing is that a trace is divided into these timed operations called spans. This is like the same terminology that Zipkin and Dapper use, uh, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's interesting about them versus just a normal timed operation is that you can establish a relationship to a parent or even multiple parents. Open tracing does support um, proper DAG tracing and not just tree tracing. Um, but anyway, the gist of it is that you can start a span, you can call it hello world, and um, uh, you know, it supports this, you know, with uh, syntax. Uh, I can log things to it, so you can treat it as kind of a micro log, and that's it. And, you know, so if I call this hello world function, it's going to create a span, and, you know, voila. So um, I'll run this program. 
Um, I'll go into my tracing system. Uh, I'll close these tabs. I'm not using them anymore. Um, uh, so I called it Hello World, I think. Um, so yeah, here's, uh, here's this thing from a few seconds ago. Um, oh, whoops. What's going on here? Something weird is happening with my mouse or something. Well, anyway, we'll see if that goes. Oh, shit. Sorry. Hold on a second. I think that the uh, display, um, there's some like weird JavaScript thing happening. Hmm. Hold on a second. Well, I can fix this this way. This is kind of horrible, but uh, some zooming issue. Anyway. Um, uh, so yeah, I can look at the span, and voila, it took you know less than a millisecond, and here are all those log messages. I added a payload just showing which iteration I was on, and you can see those too. So it was pretty straightforward, nothing, nothing too complicated, nothing too confusing. Um, it gets a lot more interesting when you have parent-child relationships. So, so that was hello world. This is hello mom. So this is parent-child relationships. You can create mom here as a parent span, and then we'll create 10 children. Um, and the way you link them up is with this child of syntax. So I say, I'm going to create a span, and I'm going to refer to my parent um, with this child of syntax. And then I'll, I'll set a tag on it. Um, Open Tracing supports the notion of key value tags in any span, which can be used for things like dimensional drill down and aggregation. Um, I think I already ran this demo, so I'll just um, do it here again. Um, uh, all right, I have, this. I have to do this stupid thing again. Um, so, um, yeah, indeed, here's mom and her kids. Um, so, unlike uh, like a network console in Chrome or something, there is this notion of parentage. This is not really that big of a deal in this example. I mean, there's only 10 of them. You can see it. In production, we see customers with traces that have like, you know, up to 10,000 of these spans. And so being able to group them in some sort of causal relationship is really important from a signal to noise perspective. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to look at. If you're looking at a concurrent system and there are 10,000 things happening concurrently, being able to say, well, I don't care about anything that's a child of this particular span and just get rid of it is, is important. Um, you can also, this yellow band is the critical path, which is something you can infer from open tracing implementation. Uh, so um, this allows us to say, well, this is, you know, you saw the example, it was serialized, so it just shows each one of these children is on the critical path of its parent. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, that's great. So another like trivial example. Um, so uh, Flask is something that I think, you know, I'm sure a lot of people here are using it. Um, there's a, a nice, clean, like, sort of Flask plugin for tracing um, that, you know, doesn't do any monkey patching uh, that you can look at if you want. Uh, but the gist of it is that one time when you're creating your app, and this is not a per, it's not like a per route thing, it's just a, a per, per process thing. You create um, a tracer, uh, you pass it, your, whatever you bound the open tracing tracer to, um, I forget what this bool is for, <laughs> but, uh, and, um, and you pass it your Flask application. And then the rest of it just happens sort of magically. So I wrote a Flask app uh, yesterday um, to uh, compute Fibonacci numbers. Um, um, and um, yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it's pretty straightforward. It just, you know, it has a base case where we return JSON one, and if it's not the base case, it looks for the, it does a recursive call to itself and uh, returns <coughs> those two things added together. So, you know, it's just like uh, normal Fibonacci, um, except doing it the stupid recursive way, not the smart way, but that's just because the example will be more interesting. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I just got this route. I say add on it. I don't actually have to do anything more than that in order to get tracing for this thing working. Um, what I've done, though, is I've um, added um, a little bit of logging information just to contextualize this. Um, and, uh, and I've uh, written uh, some client code just to actually make the request uh, to myself, um, which you know, is something you have to do. You have to just write the, the post request. But there's um, very little in, in this. Uh, all the open tracing stuff you see is just contextualizing this trace. It doesn't require changes on a on a per um, uh, what's what am I trying to say on a on a per um, uh, function per per route basis. Um, is this where I have this? Yeah. So um, 
So I'll ask for the you know fifth Fibonacci number. Well, it's zero index, so sixth really, um, and it comes back with eight. Uh, I can um, go into uh, my thing here. What did I? I don't remember what I called it. Um, it has fib in it somewhere. I'll search for this thing um, and uh, open this up. Um, and uh, yeah, so it has 15 spans showing this Fibonacci thing. If I you know, expand this out, this is the, the parent. It has these two children, which then each recursively have two children, and so on and so on, until you end up in your base case. <clears throat> um, this, of course, is kind of trivial because it's just a single process. But the critical thing is that none of that code assumed is a single process. This could be a distributed system. These could all be flask apps. And you've basically added one line of code uh, well, so that's not fair. You've added order of one lines of code. So you've added like a constant number of lines of code to each one of these applications, and you get like pretty good causal information across process boundaries um, that will allow you to like annotate these traces with a lot of detail about the values of the two children and what the current index is or whatever else you need to do for your application. So um, it's not very difficult, and it is pretty valuable. So this is the, the gist of, um, uh, of doing things with Flask. Um, for Django, it's a similar story. Uh, I think that we ended up doing, um, we, I'm showing in this case uh, a, a per view function annotation where you just say, I want to trace this. <coughs> um, let's see. Um, so I, just to make it more complicated, um, I created a, um, Django routes for a quote unquote client and another Django app that's a server. They talk to each other. It's all actually hosted within the same app. It's sort of irrelevant, but just I just wanted to make the traces more complicated. So um, I'm, you know, I have this Django client. It's really just doing um, uh, normal stuff, uh, but I add this tracer trace thing to it and it will get a span created around it. Um, there is one interesting thing here where um, it's possible to communicate, you know, between um, Django and um, uh, Flask or any other open tracing enabled uh, process. Um, I was, um, I wanted to um, move on to crossing process boundaries. So there's this notion which I referred to earlier in open tracing of, of, uh, it, of injecting into uh, an RPC payload. So I had this slide back here where I said there's a portion of the payload that's open tracing specific. Um, this is where we get to that part, which I think is a really interesting part of the API and a pretty powerful part of it. So we call it an inject and extract. So this idea that you inject into something that's an arbitrary data structure that can be mapped to really anything. Um, in this case, we're mapping it to HTTP headers, but it could be mapped to something else. Um, on the other side, there's extracts. So on the server, you'll take that arbitrary object and you'll reconstruct open tracing state. And the nice thing about this is that you never need to know what the implementation of open tracing is. It's just handled transparently by the API. So, um, so you can write code that just logically says, I'm about to propagate over the network, or even it doesn't even have to be the network. In many cases, people will do this over uh, like a shared, uh, like distributed queue like Kafka or something. You can, you can inject this information into, um, into a message sent over Kafka, extract it on the other side, and establish relationships that way. Um, and um, any transport that can support any kind of metadata um, will make this really straightforward. Um, so yeah, the, the way inject actually works <coughs> is that um, I am taking a span, uh, like a currently active span object as a parameter. Um, I'm saying I want this to be encoded um, in a way that's suitable for HTTP headers. And then I pass it this kind of opaque object um, and, and add those things as headers. And, and that's all I need to do. And you can write that code once and reuse it across your entire application. I'm writing it out here longhand just to make it clear, but in general, people don't actually have to write this. It's just something you can kind of link in. But it's very easy. And the nice thing here is like, if you try to use Zipkin or something, you're going to have to, <clears throat> or my product for that matter, you'd have to like, uh, manually look into the implementation details of, okay, so which HTTP headers does it expect and what are the semantics and how are they encoded and so on and so forth. And using open tracing, you don't do any of that. You just say inject and you just take whatever it gives you and you stuff it into the HTTP hand, you, uh, header yourself. Um, or in some cases, there are wrappers for common objects, so you don't have to even do that. But you never have to deal with the encoding details of these tracers, which may sound like a small thing, but they're usually really subtle, so it's actually kind of a big thing. Um, uh, to actually invoke um, the Django server. So I have a Django client, which talks to a Django server, which then makes an RPC out to that uh, Flask thing I showed you earlier. I'll just reload this thing. Um, 
Okay, it's done. Uh, and I'll search for um, Django client. Um, and yeah, indeed, I have to do the stupid dance because of some screen resolution thing. Um, wait, what did I do wrong? Hold on a second. Oh, that's not the right one at all. I, I renamed this thing. <clears throat> ah, um, this looks good. So um, I can, uh, what am I doing here? This is all from, what I, I need to remember what I called this thing. <coughs> I'm really happy something went wrong because it's, it's disappointing when demos go according to plan. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, that looks better. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, whatever. So yeah, blah 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 blah. So more traces. Anyway, it, the the point of this is that um, it's pretty easy to get these things to play nice together, um, and you don't need to you know stress out about encoding details. And the amount of code you write is actually very small, despite the fact that the instrumentation you get at the other end is semantically pretty rich. So um, that sends my code walkthrough. Um, so let's talk about um, the current status of the project. It's actually pretty young. Um, people from um, uh, a number of companies that uh, care about this get together um, about twice a year to talk about tracing in general. And we were doing that um, last December. And a bunch of us were really frustrated about this standardization issue. Um, and, uh, and so we started talking about this thing called distributed context propagation, which is literally what this is. And we realized that was like a really bad name. So we just changed it to be called open tracing. And, and we started writing code in like December of last year. And then we had kind of a proof of concept for ourselves to play with earlier this year. Um, at this point, there are implementations um, that bind open tracing to um, Zipkin, and um, Uber has a pretty high quality uh, kind of uh, wire compatible version fork of Zipkin called Jaeger, which is open source. Um, this thing called AppDash, which is a nice little tiny in process tracer, exists. There are several others that are like that. Uh, my company has one. A bunch of larger companies have been planning to build open tracing adapters as well. Um, um, those are implementations of open tracing. Um, and a bunch of companies, um, my, uh, I refer to them as hipster engineering companies, um, places where they would hire people with beards and stuff. Um, they, um, they've adopted uh, this technology internally. Um, and there are you know, a bunch of integrations that are available now for Python. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to get out of this talk, for me, honestly, was to talk to people here who think this is fun. I'd be happy to talk with any of you about like adding instrumentation to your favorite Python project. Um, as long, <coughs> excuse me. As long as it has to do with distributed systems, it's probably relevant, and it's pretty fun. Like you, it's um, it's usually like pretty clean, easy code, and it's like draws pictures, so you know it's cool. Uh, and yeah, so but there's been a lot of traction. Almost all of those integrations ha have been the last couple of months. The project's so new, um, but. Uh, by the end of the year, I anticipate that many more of these things will exist, and we're starting to see a lot of traction um, for like multilingual tracing, which is you know, the whole point, really. Um, yeah, uh, so how you kind of get involved, um, you can send me an email, you can send me a Twitter message, you can get, you know, go to our Gitter or whatever and talk with us about it. I'm happy to uh, have coffee with anyone who's based in the Bay Area anytime you want to. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's all I had prepared. I, I'd love to take some Q&A and if people just have, even if it's not a question, you just want to say something, I think that's great too. I, I, don't, like the, I don't like the sound of my own voice, so. Looks like we've got a taker, so. I think they're gonna pass the mic around, so. Oh, I get to stand oh even better. Yeah. Okay. Whatever works. Uh, yeah, that was a great talk. I didn't know about the open tracing effort, so it's good to hear that you guys are working on that. Um, what is kind of open tracing's take on things like Cython and V8 and running JavaScript and having like these messages context passed back and forth? I think it's awesome, personally. Um, <laughs> I mean, just from a technology standpoint, um, you know, JavaScript as a language is so lucky that they happen to be built into the browser because they've gotten so much attention from a performance standpoint. And there's like no reason why V8, or you know, couldn't have been written for something else, you know. But um, uh, yeah, I, you know, it actually dovetails pretty nicely with open tracing due to the fact that it's such an explicit system I mean it's it's pretty static in a way the instrumentation and and the mechanism I was describing earlier to propagate context around um, it's pretty cool in a way that uh, back in the um, this example I was showing oh god coffee hold on um, <clears throat> I forgot to bring water up here so I'm drinking coffee to 
keep this tickle out of my throat. It's a terrible, terrible idea. Um, uh, <laughs> feeling pretty, pretty wired right now. So, um, yeah, uh, right. This this instance right here. Um, so, I'll make it even larger. So, if you say child of parent span, <coughs> what's really cool about this in open tracing is that that can be an in-memory object, but it can also be this when inject and extract propagate uh, something called a context object in open tracing context. The child of can also be a context, which means if you're trying to switch between. Um, VMs or whatever, you can propagate, you can, you can represent your state as some kind of language neutral object. You could even represent it in like a protobuf format or whatever. That can be a part of the tracer implementation. And you can create these sorts of parent-child relationships. And because it's a distributed systems tracing framework, it doesn't, like doing that sort of stuff is pretty clean. You just think of it as two separate processes and, and there's really no problem. So that, that works nicely as long as you have some kind of shared memory that you can use to, to get data from one to the other. If you don't have that, it's difficult. I think like looking up a thread local from one to the other, for instance, is probably a non-starter. But if you have some kind of parameter you can pass just a blob of data through, open tracing will make that very elegant, I think. so. Other questions or comments or flames or whatever? Okay, great. Can you talk a little bit more about where that data is going? Where the data is going after the open tracing library grabs it? Yeah, well, that, that's entirely the responsibility of the, um, of the implementation. And um, uh, actually, I have a slide for this. Um, I, I kind of regret the name of open tracing, I, despite the fact that tracing is, I think, the thing that distinguishes the API design decisions and that like all this stuff about parents and children and so on is very much a distributed tracing concept. Um, it's really just an instrumentation library. And, um, and we actually have people, this hasn't been open source, but I know of companies that have taken this data, sorry, taken the API from open tracing and just pushed it straight into Prometheus or pushed it straight into StatsD because you're getting all this timing information that's pretty rich and it has tags and so on and so forth. And so the whole point of the API is not to specify that. Um, going back to the uh, earlier point I was making about the, the intentional narrowness of the API, it doesn't care where the data goes and actually doesn't have an implementation, like open tracing's repos have no implementation except for a no-op. Um, the idea is that you can bind it to one or multiple um, uh, you know, downstream systems. And so one of them could be Zipkin, one of them could be StatsD or Prometheus or whatever, and that's fine, actually. And in fact, I think it's good. So, And yeah, si similarly with a logging system, a lot of the detailed information is, is nice just to pipe into a verbose logging pipeline or a log aggregation system could handle that data nicely as well. Question up here, I think. Thanks. Uh, I got a couple questions. One is I saw your code. I mean, when you try to inject, would it be possible the inject uh, method itself through exception and uh, just mess around the rest of the code? Um, so, what, what do you mean, is it possible for in inject implementations to throw exceptions? Yeah. It is possible, um, and I, I mean, are you saying that's bad? Uh, no, I'm not, but just. <laughs> uh, I mean, in some ways, I think it's bad. I've, um, I, we actually were having a debate on the open tracing Java thing recently about this. In Java, you can declare an exception as, you know, uh, you, you can force the programmer to catch it so they can't accidentally get sideline, you know, sort of uh, sideswiped by an exception they weren't anticipating. But if I were writing a Flask app or something like, well, Flask is not a good example because we can fix it just at the Flask layer. But but if I did decide to write my own extract, extract is really more of a problem than inject. Inject can't fail in very many ways. It's like as long as the data structure you're past is valid and isn't like not isn't none or something, there's no reason it would fail. But extract can fail in any number of ways. Like the data can be incomplete. It can be corrupt, et cetera. And, um, and there is sort of an open question in my mind as to whether or not it's better to raise an exception in that situation, which is certainly like, it's more, it's more informational. I mean, a, a correct implementation, a, a correct um, uh, cr a calling code would try to catch that exception, which is documented. But if at my experience as monitoring systems is that nothing makes people more angry than when like, their monitoring system takes down their application. <laughs> so um, even if it results in incorrect monitoring data, I think that's probably better than potentially you know, raising an exception that interferes with application semantics. Um, uh, one thing I, this is a nice segue into this other thing. Um, so open tracing has this really cool feature called baggage, which I didn't talk about yet, but, but this is why you would want to throw an exception. So there's a paper um, called pivot tracing um, that won best paper at, um, at uh, a distributed systems conference last fall um, that 
uh, introduced this concept of baggage. Open tracing is kind of a poor man's version of what they did in pivot tracing, but the cool thing about baggage is like, okay, so we have this explicit context propagation mechanism in open tracing where we go across process boundaries. So we could be process we could be propagating just tracer state, which is useful for tracing, but we could be propagating application state as well. And um, that really introduces some pretty amazing possibilities. Like at, at Google, the, the team that uh, I started for Dapper was initially tasked with solving performance problems. It's now st staffed in the area of the company that is responsible more for resource allocation and attribution. And that's because you know, Google's equivalent of Cassandra, um, they tag every single disk I.O. operation, not with like the immediate peer, but with the thing way up here. And they know that because they propagate that state, that key value pair gets all the way down from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack. So they can say, like, I know that web search or Gmail or ads or any of the other 1,000 groups at Google, I know what percentage, uh, in fact, I know how many bytes of disk I.O. op each one of them is responsible for because they're propagating this stuff through. Super, super powerful. And there's a project called OpenCTX, Open Context, that's also out of Uber, which is just in its infancy. It really just started a few weeks ago. But, but they're trying to do something like this that's even more profound in that you can specify semantics at join, point, join points and stuff where they're actually going to be implementing like distributed lamp work clocks using this sort of inject extract mechanism. So if you're talking about that, then your application semantics are actually tied up in your tracing instrumentation. And I think throwing an exception or whatever raising exception is a totally reasonable thing to do. Um, but, uh, but I have like, I have a lot of discomfort around it. If uh, I actually would rather that, that we just didn't raise exceptions. Uh, yeah. Another question is, uh, uh, my job as a uh, like performance engineer and normally involve like a troubleshooting, uh, post modern like, you know, trouble. I'll try to avoid that. But uh, reason is we try to keep a lot of a context when this issue happen. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing the tracing, would it be possible to get some system level data, say yeah. D-Trace or in Windows yeah. ETW and send it data over? Yes, it's possible. I mean, that's up to the tracing system, and I think a good tracing system does exactly that. I think you're, you're totally, totally on the mark. Like, if something bad happens, you want to know everything you possibly can. Um, a lot of tracing systems historically have had trouble with this because they, that, I mean, the amount of data that you generate in a high throughput system is so overwhelming that you have to sample it. You have, it's not cost effective not to sample it. And so um, Dapper would sample one out of a thousand requests, and they did that. They made that decision at the top of the request tree. So you'd get the entire request or none of the requests. Or, but uh, you'd get a very small percentage of them, um, and Zipkin does something similar. That makes the type of thing you're talking about really problematic because when the error occurs, there's um, only a 0.1% chance that you're even in a sampled context. Um, that is not something that open tracing dictates. That's an, an issue with implementation. My company, actually, our basic thesis is to stop doing that. <laughs> um, so it's definitely possible, but it requires like a lot of kind of fancy systems programming to make it work. Um, but but um, it's definitely possible, and I think you're I 100% agree with the sentiment of this. Um, the last thing I'll say about that, uh, just uh, since we're talking, this is on the performance track here, I think uh, a big um, misconception that I, I, people will say um, that their library um, has X percent performance overhead. It really bothers me when people say that because performance really should be thought about in terms of latency and throughput, and they're very different things. And like, I think for a monitoring application that has like a lot of value, like if you were able to do what you just said, like you could capture like full D-trace style information for like the seconds previous to uh, like a a rarely occurring error, like that's like incredibly useful, right? Um, and I would easily pay a couple percent in throughput for that. I wouldn't pay anything in latency for anything if it's a latency sensitive system, because latency just bottle, you know, it, it goes all the way up the stack. Throughput doesn't. So, um, so like uh, that's something that comes up the tracing systems a lot. Like people will talk about the overhead of tracing systems, but if they don't, they don't like distinguish between latency and throughput. I think they're kind of missing the point. And to really answer your question, like I don't think it's possible to do what you're suggesting without some amount of throughput overhead in heavily loaded systems. I think the latency overhead can be kept kind of minimal regardless, but the throughput overhead is probably in the single digit percent for um, heavily loaded applications in Python. This is great. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. I, I think I was supposed to end around now. Yeah. Good. Um, I, I appreciate you coming, and happy to answer questions afterwards.